The third episode of Season 2 of House of the Dragon, titled The Burning Mill, was just released. In this video, I'll be counting down the top 10 most compelling costumes from the episode, highlighting any callbacks to Season 1 and Game of Thrones, and there are a lot. This episode was packed full of costumes, actually too many for me to cover in this video, so I'll do my best to highlight the most important. Warning, there will be spoilers for all of Season 1 and Episodes 1 through 3 of Season 2. I won't touch on any Fire and Blood spoilers, so please refrain from leaving those in the comments. Thank you. For the purpose of this video and the season at large, I won't include any costumes from Season 1 or any of the repeats that we've seen in this season so far. However, while Sir Kristen Cole is wearing the Kingsguard armor as he's worn since last season, I wanted to mention that they've added the Hand of the King linking Hand's chain of office to his armor. I mentioned this before in my teaser reaction video, but in case you didn't see it, the chain of office was first seen in Game of Thrones on Robert Baratheon's hand, John Aaron, as he lay in state. Like many of the jewelry pieces worn in Game of Thrones, it was made by Steenson's Jewelers in Ireland. Tyrion Lannister wore a chain of office on his armor during the Season 2 episode Battle of the Blackwater. Now let's get on with the countdown. Number 10, Rhaenyra Septa Habit Disguise. This costume was quite the surprise, but since it's a well-known one, despite House of the Dragon taking place about 180 years before the events of Game of Thrones, I have it at the bottom of my list. Septas are the female clergy of the Faith of the Seven. Some notable Septas in Game of Thrones include Septa Mordain, who served House Stark and tutored Sansa and Arya Stark in Season 1, and Septa Unella, a devoted follower of the High Sparrow who was imprisoned in the Black Cells by Cersei Lannister in Season 5. Rhaenyra's costume consists of a light grey linen wimple, a body-forming darker grey kirtle featuring wrist and back lacing, and a rope belt. Number 9, Rhaenyra Pleated Wrap Technically, this is an add-on to Rhaenyra's red burnout velvet gown from last episode, but I loved it so much that I wanted to include it on the list. The wrap is made from pleated velvet, reminiscent of a Scottish arisade, and it's fastened at the shoulder with a Celtic-style brooch. The fabric may have been custom pleated for the show by Cement Pleating, who did all of the pleating for Game of Thrones, and it looks like the trellis pleat. Now, when I saw this wrap, it immediately brought to mind Melisandre's dark gray cowl from the early seasons of Game of Thrones. And while I had Rhaenyra's scaly black dress as the third most compelling costume in the episode A Son for a Son, something I didn't notice until this episode is the pleated dark red petticoat under her gown akin to Danny's many dresses. Number 8, Mysaria Grey Ensemble. This is one of the prettiest outfits worn in season 2. After spending two episodes in a worn-out costume from Season 1, Mysaria joins the Black Faction in this two-piece ensemble. I prefer this look on her as some of her Season 1 outfits had a bit of a sci-fi vibe. Now, I'm not entirely sure what fabric this is made from, but the soft grey fabric has a bit of a luster, and its colour is perfect for the white worm. From a Western perspective, it calls to mind the 18th century Carico, an informal women's jacket style based on working class jackets. Caracos were thigh length and open in the front with tight three quarter length or long sleeves. For example, this Carico and matching petticoat from around 1770 to 1780 is from the V&A. And from an Eastern perspective, the collar and shape of the over jacket remind me of a short Japanese kasode or jimbari. The look is finished off with a matching waist cincher or obi belt. You might recall that my saria in the show is from Yiti, a change from the books. George R. R. Martin has stated that Yiti is loosely a fantasy analog of Imperial China or the Far East. Number seven, Gawain High Tower Armor. It was exciting to finally see a proper introduction for Gwen after his brief appearance at King Viserys' tournament in Season 1. His armor in Season 2 is a significant upgrade compared to his previous rook chess piece armor. Now he wears a stunning green velvet brigandine and plate armor adorned with decorative bands similar to the King's Guards. 
Underneath, Gawain dons a quilted and studded gambeson and a male shirt, while on the lower portion, he sports greaves for shin protection. The high tower house sigil, a white stone watchtower crowned with a green flame, is prominently featured on his gorget. This sigil also appears on the high tower men at arms, like those standing behind Alicent and Helena at the funeral. Completing his look is a flowing green cape. As I mentioned in another video, his gorget and pauldrons are slightly undersized, causing them to butt up against each other. I rarely notice horse armor, or barding as it's called, but dare I say that Gawain's horse might even upstage him with its impressive gear. Number 6. Aegon Valyrian Armor Aegon wears Aegon the Conqueror's Valyrian steel armor. Showrunner Ryan Condal takes some creative liberties with the lore, stating, We hear a lot about Valyrian steel weapons. We don't hear a lot about Valyrian steel armor, but it felt like something Aegon the Conqueror would have had from his time in old Valyria as a House Targaryen family heirloom. Now, despite Condal's deviation from the lore, I don't mind the look of this armor. It has an old-fashioned appearance that I think ties into the dark and weighty aesthetic of Aegon's helmet bearing Aegon the Conqueror's crown, which we'll see in a future episode, and his Valyrian steel sword Blackfire. There has been some chatter online about how the armor looks ill-fitting on Aegon, which is entirely possible since it was originally made for Aegon, who was described in the books as tall and broad-shouldered. I think the armor also has an insect-like quality, reminiscent of a dragon hunter, which is a type of club-tailed dragonfly. Though I don't have a clear picture, I do suspect that the steel features the characteristic watered appearance, similar to real-world Damascus steel. The chevron pattern on Aegon's breastplate evokes Loras Tyrell's green arming doublet, with green being the dominant color of House Tyrell. Additionally, there is an historical example of this type of breastplate in the Italian field armor of King Henry VIII of England. And if you look closely, you'll notice the metal scales on the sleeves of Aegon's gambeson are adorned with mail and scales resembling dragon claws, which also remind me of razor blades. Aegon isn't wearing pauldrons, but based on the trailers, we know they will be added to his armor in future episodes. If you enjoy this kind of content, consider subscribing to my channel, or if you would like to support the channel in a more meaningful way, I've set up a Patreon with tiers that offer perks. You can find the link in my description below. Number 5. Damon Prince Charming During a dreamlike sequence, his grace looked princely in a grey linen shirt and high-waisted fitted black trousers tucked into tall black leather boots. Since he arrived on a dragon and didn't appear to pack any luggage for his stay at Harrenhal, I assume these are his foundation garments worn under his armor. Throughout the season so far, the men in the green faction, like Sir Criston Cole and King Aegon, often wear creamy linen shirts. However, the gray shirt fits Damon's palette of silver, gray, black, and the occasional pop of red. One reason I rank this outfit so high on my list is because he looks amazing in it. Additionally, the shirt features sweet honeycomb smocking on the upper sleeves, giving them some fullness. It's ever so dark, but it also appears to have some embroidery on the front and at the shoulder seams. Now, the smocking is a callback to the always well-dressed Loras Tyrell, the only character in all of Game of Thrones to have this detail on their sleeves, to my knowledge. Number 4. Reyna Targaryen Red Dress Reyna appears very briefly in a lovely berry red dress when tasked with a mission assigned by Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen. The color likely combines the Targaryen red from her father's side and the nautical blue of House Valarian from her late mother's side. The fabric seems to be a jacquard, and if you zoom in closely, you can see a subtle chevron motif that might nod to dragon scales. While the dress itself is simple, the stomacher is embellished with intricate pleating detail. Though I don't know the exact name of the pleat, some of my viewers who do embroidery might recognize it. It looks similar to a reverse star pleat from cement pleating. Along the edge of the stomacher and nestled in the pleating are burgundy-colored beads that sparkle in the light. Reyna has worn the same necklace since the beginning of the season. At first, I thought the dangly bits were shaped like scallop shells, but they more closely resemble an ulu, 
an Inuit knife traditionally known as a woman's cutting tool. The necklace looks very exotic, so it might have come from another part of the world, possibly as a gift from her grandfather Corlys. Number 3. Rhaenyra Targaryen Hooded Coat Dress I feel like we haven't spent much time with Raina this season, but in this episode, she wears one of my favorite costumes in the show so far. For her departure from Dragonstone, Raina dons a gorgeous hooded coat dress. The brocade fabric has a tree bark-like texture in shades of purple and red, and the hanging sleeves and hood are lined with shot taffeta or hand-dyed taffeta in streaks of purple and red that mirror the colors on the coat. The front of the coat features an embellishment of two dragons with bare teeth breathing flames. This stunning costume immediately reminded me of one of my favorite costumes from Game of Thrones, Melisandre's purple and red wood grain kimono style dress. Number two, Bela Dragon Riding Ensemble. Bela does some scouting in a dragon riding ensemble that's full of texture. While her costume in the previous episode had a silhouette similar to Daenerys Targaryen, this dragon riding outfit leans in heavily towards Daenerys' costumes from season six and beyond. The most significant callback is the flat chevron pleated red cape, along with the brooch fastening it to her shoulder. In Game of Thrones, Daenerys gifted matching dragon brooches to Masande and Grey Worm. Bela's brooch is in the shape of an Ouroboros, a circular symbol depicting a snake or dragon devouring its own tail, representing the eternal cycle of destruction and rebirth. Another callback to Game of Thrones is the chain of intent worn by Daenerys in place of a crown. I mentioned in a previous video that Bela and Jace are aligned in color, but I have also outlined that the plastron on the front of her costume is similar to Gisera's. While Daenerys often wore chevrons on many of her costumes, I don't plan on delving into the symbolism this season because by the end of Game of Thrones, it didn't hold much significance. The sleeves on Bela's costume feature rows of mail woven into the knit fabric. Finally, the skirt of the ensemble appears to be made from the same fabric as the gambeson worn under Rainey's armor in the premiere episode, tying into Bela's connection to her grandmother. Before we get to the number one most compelling costume of the episode, here are a few honorable mentions. Allison Hightower Green Gown now, I didn't see enough of a difference between this costume and her others to highlight it here, but I still think it deserves a mention. Alice Rivers' brocade dress. I will feature this costume in an upcoming video. Helena Green dress. Again, this dress wasn't featured enough in the episode to be on this list, but I did want to mention that Helena is wearing her mother's gold necklace with a stone pendant from season one. And now the most compelling costume in the episode. Allison Teal Blue Dress In the last episode, Allison returned to wearing blues, perhaps signaling her regret for her past actions. Therefore, it feels fitting that she arrives at the Grand Sept dressed in a teal green brocade gown. I should note that on the poster, the gown appears green, unlike the vivid blue-green color seen on screen. Now, I might be speculating here. But Allison's gown, with its elaborate embroidery and crystals, seems to echo Marjorie Tyrell's purple wedding gown from Game of Thrones. In the books, Marjorie's mother was a leery high tower. Instead of the thorny rose canes adorning Marjorie's gown, Allison's gown features subtle, web like details and brings to mind Sir Walter Scott's poem, Marmion, A Tale of Flodden Field, which includes the famous line, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Of all of her costumes so far in season two, this one boasts the most embroidery. I wonder if by the end of the show, Alicent might be completely weighed down and smothered by it all. Wouldn't that be cool? Embroidery artist and friend of the show, Casta Hex, has indicated that these are cracks beginning to appear in the facade. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the costumes in episode 3 or this season so far. I'll have more House of the Dragon content coming your way over the coming weeks. Thank you as always for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video.